Good Sunday morning to the class and uh, to our visitors. Welcome, uh, whenever you're watching and from wherever you're watching. We are finding our roots in the past. We'll be looking at John Calvin today, who had a tremendous influence on the progress of the Reformation. And as always, I certainly hope that what you hear, what you see is accurate. If it isn't, please let me know, we'll make corrections. I certainly hope that you are blessed and informed by the class and that God receives the glory. So let's uh, begin our study today as we go back to the time of the Reformation. And John Calvin, 1509 to 1564. First, a few things about Calvin, uh, just generally, and then we'll, we'll expand that. He was converted at the University of Paris. He studied under Martin Bucer at Strasbourg. He became the pastor of St. Peter's Church in Geneva. And he is the author of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Now, early years of Calvin? Well, he came from humble ancestry. And yet he maintained the manners of nobility, his demeanor, his vocabulary, his reaction with people. One would think he was a noble. He was born at Noyon, that's in France, in Picardy, 60 miles northeast of Paris, 26 years younger than Luther. Therefore, he belonged to the second generation of reformers. That is important. It was the first generation, and I'm speaking here of Luther and Zwingli and Busser, this first generation of reformers were, uh, this, this first generation of reformers, excuse me, was um, exploring and plowing ahead uh, with the Reformation. They were uncovering great truths. The second generation had the advantage of their work and could build upon it. And that was Calvin's position. He took advantage of all that Luther and Zwingli and Bucer had already uh, set forth in their teaching. Calvin was a person who was slight in build. And his father wanted him to be a priest from the very beginning. Now here in the, on the left is a picture of Noyon Cathedral. In that cathedral, Calvin's father was the notary, took care of the books. And on the right, you see the Calvin Museum, which was constructed at the location of his house in Noyon. And he went to the University of Paris and matriculated in his early teens, studied at the College Montaigu. And in 1528, he transferred to the School of Law when his father needed his help. His father, the notary at Noyon Cathedral, was in trouble with the books, with the finances, and he was just uh, overcome with the, the workload. He asked his son to transfer to the School of Law and return to Noyon to help him <laughs> at the cathedral. However, his father died in 1531. The necessity was removed, and so uh, Calvin returned to his first love, the study of theology. And on the left, you see the uh, illustration of the College of Montague. Uh, this is from about 1850. It was the same college that Erasmus attended and that Ignatius Loyola attended. It was the college for poorer students who could not afford the tuition normally charged. We have noted that all of the reformers except Luther began as humanists, which seems strange, but humanism focuses on text, determining the accurate text and operating from the primary sources. And Calvin was thus influenced to follow humanistic studies when he was at the University of Paris. He developed a very good Latin style while there. And in 1531, he published his first work, which was a humanist work, Commentaries on the 
Roman philosopher, politician, Seneca. Now his conversion to reformed theology was a mysterious one. It took place while he was at Paris and uh, it, it, we don't know much about it. He was very secretive about it, didn't talk about it. Very little is said, but we do know that after this experience and after this obvious change in his life, other students came to him to learn what he believed. He commented on that, that he, as even a novice, found himself in the position of advising his fellow students. He was convinced of God's sovereignty and omnipotence. That seems to be one primary change in his understanding of theology. And from the beginning, and he never doubted it, he felt himself to be the chosen instrument of God. And in his own words, they, there are only two places that, where he seems to comment on his conversion. One of them is in a letter uh, to a, a cardinal, and the second one is in his commentary on the Psalms. And this is from his account. He says, and first, since I was too obstinately devoted to the superstitions of popery to be easily extricated from so profound an abyss of mire, God, by a sudden, perhaps unexpected, conversion, subdued and brought my mind to a teachable frame, which was more hardened in such matters than might have been expected from one at my early period of life. Having thus received some taste and knowledge of true godliness, I was immediately inflamed with so intense a desire. There were consequences. An interesting consequence was the fact that he and Nicholas Kopp became friends. Nicholas Kopp had accepted similar theological views. Kopp was the rector at College Montague and uh, was to deliver the rectorial address. He asked Calvin to help him, which he did. And Calvin produced an address that was very profoundly, very openly reformed in its teaching in its, in, no, in its tones, and both students, as a result, were expelled from the University of Paris for their Protestant beliefs, not only expelled, but imprisoned, because the king was not amused. And Calvin was released from prison, but did have to leave Paris. Subsequently, he had to leave France after the famous day of placards in 1534. We are familiar in our day with demonstrations and everyone knows from looking at the news that uh, people demonstrating will carry uh, cards, placards, signs, and they will put on that slogans and they will always be extreme. They will be provocative in, in what they say. They want to get across their point from a very a radical position. And that's exactly what these Protestants did on the day of placards. They went all over uh, Paris, uh, right under the king's nose, so to speak, advertising uh, that uh, they were opposed to the Pope and to the doctrines of the Roman church. And as a result, all of Protestants were forced to leave France. Calvin now had to take refuge someplace. So he went to Basel, which was already a reformed city in Switzerland. And he was there for two years. Remember that John Oikolampadius was the pastor in Basel. And there in Basel, with uh, Johann Froben's printing press being there, he published his first edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, which will be revised and expanded in three subsequent editions. Now, this first edition was primarily devotional. It was a commentary on uh, the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, some of the basic teaching of Scripture. But as he subsequently revised it, he added more and more detail until it became complete and was the single most influential book of the Reformation. When it was finished, it was clear, orderly, systematic, resting entirely upon Scripture. And it is because of this book as well as the 
uh, people who came to Geneva and were educated there and go forth with the doctrines of the Reformation. It was because of this book and those efforts of these people that the Reformation spread so far and wide. Now, Busser, Martin Busser, who was uh, Calvin's mentor, did a lot of the legwork, so to speak, the basic work of uh, uh, investigating and coming to terms with theological doctrines. However, Busser was loquacious. Busser could not write succinctly. His writing was not only lengthy, but it was hard to follow. And, and Calvin's gift was to systematize theology clearly. And he could write in a way that was easy to understand. If you read the Institutes, you could understand very easily what Calvin is saying. Now, his beliefs that he expresses uh, in his preaching and in the Institutes, his goal was to restore the purity of Christianity before it was corrupted by Roman Catholicism. In a large extent, all of the reformers had that goal. Calvin very definitely did. Now he saw God as the creator of the universe, as the preserver of the universe, as the governor of the universe, and emphasized that in his teaching. And he was very careful to make sure that what he wrote was in line with scriptures, with the Apostles' Creed, with St. Augustine. And he believed firmly that man fell in the Garden of Eden. And so he, he begins with the fall and points out how God worked out one consistent scheme of redemption. There's no plan B. There is just this eternal plan of redemption. In regard to grace, Calvin believed that man was sinful and incapable of doing good work on his own, apart from the grace of God, and therefore could in no way save himself, was therefore dependent entirely upon God's grace. And he believed, much in line all the way back with St. Anselm, that God's justice was satisfied by the death of Christ, that man's sin was so severe and the affront to God's holiness was so great that the only way that could be resolved was by the death of the Son of God. And that man would be justified when he trusted in Christ. And in that process of justification, there would be this double exchange, this double imputation, Christ taking man's sin and man being clothed with the perfect righteousness of Christ. Therefore, man's sin imputed to Christ, Christ's perfect righteousness imputed to the believer. And the faith by which one trusts in Christ is itself a gift of God's grace and cannot be manufactured out of man's own uh, desires. In regard to election and preservation, Calvin shared with all reformers a belief in God's elective decrees, that is, in predestination and in the preservation of God's elect. But Calvin will define it more clearly, perhaps, than all, except Luther. I think we'd have to say Luther probably does the most uh, uh, forceful job in defining predestination. Calvin, much more reserved and much more thorough, perhaps. He believed that God would indeed preserve his elect to eternal life, but believed that man had the responsibility to respond to God's grace in holiness, good works, and faithful obedience. Thus, God preserves his elect to eternal life, but his elect have the responsibility to persevere in good works and holiness and obedience. Now to Calvin, the church, the one church of Christ, was the sum of God's elect. It was invisible, it is invisible, and its members are known only to God. Thus the universal, invisible church of the elect. But believers in one community become the visible church. <clears throat> and this visible church exists wherever the word is faithfully preached and heard and the sacraments and church discipline are faithfully administered. 
these concepts were published in the Ecclesiastical Ordinances of 1541. In the organization of the church, he implemented concepts he had learned from Martin Bucer. And therefore, he implemented, he established the offices in the church, which really are found in the writings of, of Paul in the New Testament, particularly in Philippians and Ephesians, that there would be ministers or pastors in every church. He called them the venerable company. There would be elders, which you call the consistory. Recall that it was Bucer who reintroduced elders into the church after so many centuries of their absence as they were absorbed into the office of priest by the early church. So we have the elders, the consistory, and the teachers of doctrine, and the council of deacons. In regard to the sacraments, he accepted Bucer's view of the sacraments. In regard to the communion, he accepted Bucer's doctrine of the spiritual presence and thus Christ being with us and the elements and being the true body and blood of Christ taken under the form of the cup and of the bread. Bucer spent years working this out and he taught Calvin and Calvin accepted it. This becomes the doctrine in the Reformed churches. Now, Calvin wanted communion in all churches at least, at least once weekly. That was his desire. Calvin didn't always get what he wanted in Geneva because the city council <clears throat> denied his request. They overruled him. Now, the reasons for that, we don't know. Sometimes uh, people say communion can become commonplace uh, and uh, it loses its meaning if it's observed weekly, yet the word is preached weekly. And in regard to baptism, <clears throat> he held a very high view of the importance and the necessity of baptism. In regard to scriptures, again, a very high view of scripture, much in line with Zwingli's view and Bucer's view of scripture. He believed that there was one book, Old and New Testament. It is one Bible that revealed one plan of human redemption. Thus, he would not accept the idea that we are New Testament Christians. We are whole Bible Christians. And therefore, those people who followed his teaching were truly a people of the book. And he believed, certainly in line with Singley, that we should not act without scriptural authority. And with Bucer and his idea that he set forth that we should define that which was essential in the teaching and practice of the church. Now, as with all the magisterial reformers, he believed in a Christian community that extends beyond the local church to the entire community. And he worked hard to create a true community at Geneva in the same way that Booster worked hard and successfully did create a true community in Strasbourg. And to, to a large extent, Zurich, uh, with uh, Zwingli. But this involved a cooperation of church and state. And when we talk about state at this time, we are talking uh, in regard to the city council. Now, Luther was an exception. He was answerable to uh, a duke, but Zwingli and Bucer and Calvin were answerable to the city council. And they depended upon that council for support. Now, in regard to this whole community, Calvin believed that everyone, each person, had a calling of God to a line of work to fulfill the glory of God. Often we refer to that as the Protestant work ethic. It works simply this way. God calls everybody to some line of work that is their calling. Now, from the human standpoint, it might be menial and not so prestigious as somebody else's calling. But in the sight of God, they were equal. And what was important was that no matter what call your calling was, how low it might seem in the eyes of the community, yet it was, you do the work to the glory of God. You, you work as hard as you can. You put forth maximum effort because you are seeking to glorify God. Now, that had a great effect upon the economy because wherever 
the doctrines of Calvin went, there you see an increase in the economy of that particular state. Now, comparing Calvin to Luther, you might say Luther was less consistent on some points. Luther could change. Uh, but I think one of the main things is Luther's emphasis was on redemption. And Calvin, on the other hand, began with creation. Luther would focus on the cross, not that Calvin didn't, but Calvin goes back to the very beginning and shows the progress of God's redemptive purposes through the covenants. And Calvin will stress more than Luther, the omnipotence of God. Now, let's look at some of the details in Calvin's life. He, uh, remember, was started in Paris and was kicked out of Paris, and then he was kicked out of the whole country of France after the day of placards. And uh, he went to Basel, but he decided to go back to France to see how the Protestants were faring there. That trip took him through Geneva, and he stopped off to see Gillian Farrell, we would say William Farrell, who was the pastor in Geneva. So the Re Reformation was underway already in Geneva. While he was there and became acquainted with Farrell, Farrell persuaded him to stay and work with him in Geneva to create a true Christian community, which of course was the goal of Calvin. And secondly, to clean up the disgracefully low morals of the city of Geneva. Of course, Calvin did not want to stay there. He wanted to go back to Basel. He just wanted to go to France to see how things were going. But Farrell knew how to deal with Calvin. And he said to him, I know, John, that God wants you to stay and work with me in Geneva. Well, he persuaded him and he stayed. <clears throat> Here is Guillaume Farrell, the first reformer of Geneva. And so, for the next two years, Calvin was in Geneva. And in that first year, 1536, the council officially voted for the Reformation. And you see that date, 1536, throughout Geneva. But Calvin was young, and he lacked experience at this point. And uh, soon, uh, another group of people gained control of the city council. They're called libertines simply because they believe that there should be no restrictions on people's behavior in the city. And they wanted to see the wild, immoral, uh, unrestrained behavior of the Genevan people continue. So as they gained control of the council, they wanted to get rid of these preachers who were restricting uh, the conduct of the citizens. And so they drove the reformers out of the city. Now, where was Calvin going to go at this point? He decided to go at the invitation of Busser to Strasbourg, where he stayed the next three years. He took refuge in Strasbourg. And there he worked with Busser. He went with Busser as Busser would go around uh, holding these uh, special sessions, these debates, these colloquies. Uh, meetings as well. Uh, he studied with him there in Strasbourg as Busser uh, went through the Bible to try to understand it. So he was learning theology, and at the same time, he was learning how to organize a Christian community. And in Strasbourg, he preached at a church for French Protestant exiles there. And he taught at John Sturm's Academy. Remember that Busser had established the academy. It is today the University of Strasbourg. And he wrote and worked on his institutes and other works. And he married. He married Idelette de Bour. And they had a child. It was a very happy experience. He enjoyed it thoroughly. He was growing spiritually. He was able to function in areas where he felt he had the gift to do so. Uh, so it, it, was, it was just great. This, he was happy. And here on the left, you see his wife, Idelette de Bourg. But if you notice the picture on the right, you see Calvin leaving Geneva. Uh, in that picture, he looks old, somewhat older than I would think he would in 1541. But he is not happy. And why was he not happy? There was a political shift in Geneva. Simply this. The people of Geneva were 
tired. They were weary of this wide open morality, immorality of the city and people doing the most uh, egregious things. They wanted more order and discipline in the city. So they wanted the preachers back. Given the choice between the strictness of the preachers and this uncontrolled behavior of the people, we'd rather have the preachers back. So a shift in the council and the preachers are invited back and Pharrell comes back and he wants Calvin to come back. Now, he did, Calvin did, you saw the picture. He left Strasbourg in tears. Once again, Pharrell knows how to handle John Calvin. He said to him, Calvin, not only does God want you to come, but I can tell you God will curse you if you do not come. And that got his attention and he left. And he stayed in Geneva for the rest of his life the next 23 years. And uh, he was very successful as a reformer there, thanks to Bucer, and he patterned his Christian community after that of Strasbourg. He preached, he supervised the church, and notice this, he encouraged commerce and trade, working with the city council. He is interested in the welfare of all the citizens of Geneva and he advised the city council. It was a good relationship, it was a happy time. He founded the Academy of Geneva in 1559. It again is patterned on the Academy at Strasbourg that Busser had founded. And public morality was successfully enforced in the city. And Geneva, over the course of this time, became a city of refuge for Protestants who were in exile from all over Europe. As the Protestantism spread, there was, of course, reaction on the part of the Catholics and, and the governments that were controlled by the Catholics. And the Protestants were expelled. They went to Geneva to find refuge. And in Geneva today, you see this relief sculpture on one of the streets which says Geneva, the city of refuge. This is St. Pierre, St. Peter's Church in Geneva where Calvin preached. Another view of it, backing away to see the steeple. Now, not everything was smooth for Calvin in Geneva. There were opponents. For instance, Sebastian Castello denied the inspiration of parts of the Bible, specifically the Song of Solomon. Now, Calvin could not have a prominent person in the city openly denying the inspiration of any part of the Bible, so he was expelled. Now, when I say Calvin could not, it is the council that did the work. The council expelled him from the city. Jean Balzac, was also expelled from the city for denying the doctrine of predestination. And more seriously, Jacques Gruet was executed in 1547 by the decree of the council for blasphemy and atheism. And the particular circumstances was Jacques Gruet was the son of a nobleman who thought he could get by with anything because of his position of his father in society. He had become an atheist. He didn't keep it to himself. He openly proclaimed his atheism and he openly blasphemed God. That could not be tolerated. He was executed. The second execution, Michael Servetus, a Unitarian who denied the divinity of Christ, executed in 1553. Calvin did not want him executed. It was the decree of the council. Of course, Calvin gets blamed for it by historians. Calvin and had known Servetus had had a respect for him, as Michael Servetus did for Calvin. They had corresponded. Calvin, however, warned him not to come to Geneva. He came anyway. He came under a false name, but Calvin recognized him when he was lecturing at one time. He was in the audience, and uh, he asked him to leave. He didn't leave, and consequently, he was executed. This is Michael Servetus. After Calvin's death, Theodore Bays, 
took over the leadership of the church community in Geneva. He also was a humanist in his youth. Different from Calvin, though, he was an aristocrat coming from France. He was converted during an illness, and he was only in his 20s. This is a pattern. Remember, this is true of Zwingli as well. It's true of uh, St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, it's true of Ign Ignatius Loyola. These people who came close to death had this near-death experience, and in that, when they recovered, they they became much more sensitive, much more aware of God, much more dedicated to God. Thus it was with Theodore Bays. He led the church from 1564 to 1605. Now, he wrote the constitution for the church in Geneva, and he also wrote hymns. He produced the Geneva Psalter in 1562. Here is Theodore Bays. If you go to Geneva, you see this Reformation monument, which is actually a wall at the University of Geneva. It uh, honors reformers uh, all throughout uh, Europe, and particularly these four. Uh, you see first here on the left, Farrell, secondly Calvin, then Bayes, and then John Knox. And out of Geneva, thanks to the people who came and studied in Geneva, as well as to the uh, widespread influence of the institutes, the Reformed faith will spread. In Germany, particularly to the area around Heidelberg, where the university was, and Brandenburg, where Berlin is located. And thus, the, the importance of arriving at a common confession for Reformed and Evangelical churches, just one confession. Recall, Busser worked very hard for that. He had hoped that the Augsburg Confession would be accepted not only by the Lutherans, but by the Reformed people. However, Zwingli and Bullinger did not agree to it. Hence, it became the confession only for the Lutherans. But now, once again, this is revived. We need a common confession so that the Lutherans and the uh, Reformed people, Lutherans known as evangelicals, can agree. And, and that was produced by these two young men, Zacharias Ursinus and Caspar Olivianus in 1563. It is the Heidelberg Catechism that is used widely among Reformed churches. And here you see these two men, very young at the time when they wrote it, Ursinus and Olivianus, authors of the Heidelberg Catechism. And the Reformation spread into Eastern Europe as well, into Bohemia. Of course, it really had already been there thanks to the work of, of John Huss and the Bohemian Brethren. Uh, remember that the Hutterites then also went uh, to Bohemia and joined with the Hussite churches. Now you have Reformed people going into Bohemia, joining also and uh, increasing the uh, Reformation there. However, they were pretty well destroyed in the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648. Same thing happened in Hungary, also destroyed in the war, although uh, the Reformation survived in parts of Bohemia, Moravia particularly, and in Hungary, even to this day. In Austria, the Reformation was largely Lutheran, there was a time in Vienna when 75% of the people living in Vienna were Lutherans, but they were also pretty well annihilated in the Thirty Years' War, and particularly by the Jesuits. They were dedicated to being the army of Jesus, so to speak. Now, in Scotland, the situation was somewhat different. Before Knox came to Scotland, Lutheranism had been introduced in 1525 but persecuted. Uh, example, Patrick Hamilton, who was burned for his beliefs, and then George Wishart, uh, burned in 1546 for advocating reform. He was a friend of John Knox, and Knox joined the reformers in 1547. He preached, very effective preacher, but he was exiled from Scotland. This is John Knox, uh, and the person exiling him was Mary Stuart, of course, a relative of King Henry VIII, the mother of the future King James. She was a devout Catholic. 
And when John Knox was exiled, he took refuge with Calvin in Geneva, as you might expect he would. And he preached there to English speaking exiles every day. In 1559, he returned to Scotland to establish the Reformed Church there, known as the Kirk of Scotland. This is the auditoire in Geneva, where John Knox preached every morning at six o'clock to English-speaking Reformed people in Geneva. Now, Mary, Queen of Scots, of course, was planning to take the throne of England from her cousin Elizabeth, but she was rather well thwarted by John Knox's preaching. He inveighed heavily against the tyrannical rule of women, did not believe that women should rule a state. Uh, and uh, he had much to do with her leaving Scotland. She took refuge with Elizabeth, who later did have her executed. This uh, statement is attributed to Mary, Queen of Scots, in reference to John Knox. She said, I had rather face all the armies of my enemy than one Calvinist armed with the word of God. In England, Thomas Cranmer had become Archbishop of Canterbury under Henry VIII. Henry wanted him to secure his divorce. And uh, after Henry died in 1546 and his teenage son, Edward, Edward VI became king and was very, uh, agreeable to the Reformation, Cranmer worked with him to produce the 42 articles which became the creed of uh, the Church of England under Edward. Now Martin Bucer came to England in the last two years of his life and worked closely with Thomas Cranmer to advance the Reformation there, trying to produce a Christian community as he had done, Martin Bucer had done in Strasbourg. Uh, of course, Bucer and then Cranmer died, and Mary, Bloody Mary, became the queen, and then Elizabeth. But later on, uh, under the Puritans, during the time of the Commonwealth, when the king, Charles I, uh, was executed, Oliver Cromwell was ruling, uh, Westminster standards were uh, set in place as a constitution for a reformed community in England and now become uh, the confession for reformed English, -spe English speaking reformed people. And this movement will continue with the Puritans, with the Baptists, with the Congregationalists, with the Presbyterians. Now in Holland, the reformed faith was preached by 1550. And by 1571, the Dutch Reformed Church was organized and the King of Holland accepted the Reformed faith in 1573 and accepted a Presbyterian form of government. Uh, also, the Dutch Reformed Church accepted the Heidelberg Catechism along with the Belgic Confession, which is a, uh, equally uh, sound uh, confession of faith. But there was a problem in the church there in Holland. Jakob Arminius was a professor at the University of Leiden. Jakob Arminius came to disagree with the Dutch church on five points. He did not believe in unconditional election. He did not believe in total depravity. He did not believe in the definite atonement of Christ. He did not believe in the effectual calling. Now he wanted to continue to believe that God's elect are preserved to everlasting life. That is a true Christian cannot lose his salvation. But his students pointed out that to be consistent, he needed to deny God's preservation as well, which he did. Now, this is brought to the attention of the church in Holland, and they held a synod at Dort, or Dortrich, and they convened to discuss the objections of Professor Arminius, and they condemned his five points, 1618, 1619. It's because of five points, they originally were the five points that Arminius differed with the church in Holland, and uh, we understand them as the five points of Calvinism, which is actually a reaffirmation of these traditional reformed beliefs. 
in France. Of course, Calvin's teaching is going to spread. Calvin came from France and the French preachers would come to Geneva to study at his school and would return. By 1561, there were over 2000 reformed Huguenot churches in France. The majority of the French nobility were converted to Protestantism. The leader of the Protestants in France was a nobleman, Gaspard de Coligny. This situation uh, is going to produce a reaction among the Catholics and the Catholic leader in France was the Duke of Guise, Henry Duke of Guise, who convinced the queen of France, who was Catherine de Medici, that Coligny and the Protestants were dangerous to her son, King Charles IX. The king was indeed close to Coligny and uh, this was Henry's way, Henry Duke of Guise, his way of convincing the queen that something needed to be done. And she agreed to the most outrageous, the most uh, astonishing thing. She agreed to destroy the Protestants of France in uh, 1572, August 24th, 1572, when they would come to Paris for the marriage of her daughter, Marguerite, to Henry of Navarre. It was a terrible slaughter spread from Paris throughout France. St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Now, after that, uh, her son, Henry the Ninth, would be succeeded by his brother, the third son of Catherine de Medici to rule. That would be Henry the Third, And then no other sons. So uh, the uh, crown moved to the daughter's husband, Henry IV, who was a Protestant. And he was converted to Catholicism because he wanted to save further violence in France. He said, surely Paris is worth a mass. I can still believe as I believe, but this will prevent violence. And he wanted all people in France to have freedom to pursue what they believed. So he issued the Edict of Nantes in 1598, which allowed religious freedom throughout France. Unfortunately, after he died and he was succeeded by Louis XIII, the Edict of Grasse revoked the legal protections of the Protestants and Louis XIII also destroyed uh, La Rochelle, the stronghold of the French Protestants and his successor, Louis XIV in 1685, revoked the Edict of Nantes, returning France entirely to Catholicism. Therefore, the Huguenots, the French Protestants, had to leave. Again, they had to leave. And they fled to Holland. They fled to Switzerland. They fled to Prussia. They fled to Britain. They fled to America. And everywhere they went, they not only spread the Reformed faith, but also the economy. Because of that work ethic, the economy in all these areas prospered greatly, whereas the economy in France began to decline. You see, Henry IV on the left, Louis the Thirteenth, uh, and Louis the Fourteenth. Modern France, only in 1802 did Protestants regain their legal standing. In 1907, they formed the National Union of Reformed Churches in France, and today, the Protestant Federation of France. Next week, uh, we'll look at John Wesley, and the contributions that he made uh, to the ongoing Reformation. Thank you for being a part of our study today. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope you'll join us next week and certainly have a blessed week in the, the interim uh, that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you all.